So uh, me and William Saron, we're doing a paper for explainable AI called uh, Smooth Grab. So um, the papers have five authors, which are Daniel, Nikhil, Bean, Fernanda, and Martin. Uh, it was published in the International Conference for Machine Learning for the 2017 workshop on visual visualization for deep learning. And the authors uh, have over 553 citations for their paper. Uh, they also, here's a link to their paper. They also have a, a website for their paper. And they also, in their website, they also have a link to the, your, their code on GitHub. So for the overview of this paper, we're going to go in the following order. Uh, we're going to go through definition of what sensitivity map is. Uh, we're going to go through some previous work that the authors mentioned. Uh, we're going to go right into the proposal after mentioning previous work. Uh, then we're going to go through experiments they performed. Uh, then we'll conclude and talk about the pros and cons of the paper. So what are sensitivity maps? Uh, basically, uh, they're used to visualize important features uh, for prediction, uh, which is basically, which, um, which is useful for analyzing how a machine learning model does prediction. Uh, so you work using base, the class function, the RDMAP class function, where you have the highest score, uh, class C, and the set of classes uh, C with the class activation function. Uh, so the sensitivity map is what we've done previously in class already, where we have the partial derivative with respect to the input, which is how we got perturbations. So here uh, they use ImageNet, and here's an example with the gazelle. And the sensitivity map uh, output is shown here. However, you notice that's rather noisy using just a normal sensitivity map. So, um, Previous work, uh, other people actually made improvements to highlight the informative features. So there's like two different types of ways to do this. Um, one um, that was actually covered previously, uh, partially last uh, presentation was LRP, along with, and other two methods, they compare is deep lift and integrated gradients. However, they only uh, focus on the paper on integrated gradients. So I'm gonna explain how this works real quick for context when I, show images. And these are also referred to as saliency maps for these types of methods. And they estimate the global importance of each pixel rather than local uh, sensitivity. So for how integrated gradients work, they linearly interpolate an image uh, using a certain amount of steps that you specify. So you have a baseline, it's a black image, uh, and then you have the final image here. So they change the intensity based on how many steps you use. So uh, they get the gradient for each image, like of this cat here. And basically, after that, they would use the trapezoid approximation rule to perform integration, where you have the in in gradient of the first multiplied by the adjacent one. And you divide by two to get the slope. And then you add them all up and then average them at the end, and you get the final output result for the integrated gradients. So another method involves actually modification of the bat propagation. And the one that the paper focuses on is guided bat propagation, which is actually is a modification of deconvolution or extension of it. And in the bat propagation process, they start from the high level unit. And when they are com computing the partials, they basically, they remove all the negative uh, values uh, using a ReLU activation function. So only the features that led to the the, the class store are used uh, for the gradient. And any of the negative values that are not related to the class prediction are not used then. So what the authors propose first is why uh, sensitivity maps are noisy. And they propose it could be due to uh, local variations in the partial derivative of the activation function. And they present this with an explanation with the image shown here, where they have an input image X here uh, from ImageNet, and an out, uh, the final image where they actually add a random Gaussian sample with the mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0 0.01. So in order to show the variation, uh, they actually do a scalar uh, in a range, step range from zero to one. Uh, and they take the max pixels from the gradient uh, result. So, so right here, uh, you have the uh, red red pixel channel. 
uh, blue pixels and then the green channel. And you actually you'd see uh, by varying the scale of the Gaussian noise, um, you would see that actually fluctuates. So from this, they proposed in order to alleviate this issue, they would take a local average of the gradient values. And because uh, it, taking this in the high input space is expensive, they uh, proposed using a stochastic approximation. And they use the following equation. We have the input image S, and then you have the um, Gaussian noise sample they take with a, a mean of zero and a standard deviation value they set. And they get the uh, gradient map, and then they add it. And they add it based on how many uh, samples they have, and then take the average. I don't hear you, William. So, William, you are muted. You can turn on the your audio. Oh, hold on, William. Let me do this. I forgot to activate activate the laser pointer for you. Okay. Are you there, William? Yep, one second. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. So for experimentation, then um, the researchers used two neural networks. The first model was a the first model is an inception v3 that's been pre-trained on the MNIST data set. And then the second model they used was a convolutional nor, um, MNIST model that was based on a TensorFlow tutorial. And that was pre-trained on MNIST. So heat maps are typically used for sensitivity maps where the, um, pick the um, those pixels that are highlighted are an indication of what uh, pixels are uh, the, model, the model is using to make the prediction. And to design or create their uh, sensitivity maps, uh, the researchers discussed using uh, three visualization techniques. Um, the first one is um, uh, first one is absolute uh, value. So the researchers found that the channel values for a pixel can impact the output representation. And so gradients could be positive or negative. And so the researchers had a choice whether to either preserve the positive or negative values or take the absolute value. And they found that this very much depended on uh, the data set. So in the case of MNIST, uh, they found that it was beneficial to take uh, this to keep the sign values, while with um, ImageNet, it was better to take the absolute values. So, um, the reason why they did this was because uh, for MNIST, many of the uh, images uh, uh, um, have numbers where all the numbers are the same color and they're placed against a dark background. So a positive gradient would be a positive signal towards uh, the class. But they found that uh, with ImageNet, objects could have different colors. So it, it could be, very, it could be uh, similar. Um, you could get an image, for example, they're classifying a ball. They could get an image very similar to MNIST where you have a light ball against a dark background where uh, just like an MNIST, a positive gradient would be a positive signal to the class. But it could also be true that um, they could get a dark ball against a light background and a negative gradient would be a positive indicator of the class. And so, uh, depending on the context, you know, you, uh, the gradient could be a, a positive signal for uh, whether you have a positive gradient or a negative gradient. And so the researchers found it was uh, decided to take the absolute values uh, in creating their sensitivity maps. And this often produced a, a better output representation. Um, in addition to taking the absolute value, a second visualization technique they used was capping values. So um, they found that um, in creating their sensitivity maps, sometimes they would get 
um, outlier pixels that would have above average gradients. And this often threw off the color scales and sensitivity maps. And so uh, what these, uh, so often uh, if they didn't cap the values, um, they found that they would get uh, mostly dark images with a few outlier pixels that would be highlighted. And so they found that by capping the gradients to a relatively high value, they were able to produce a much more coherent map. And they found out about 99th percentile was sufficient to be able to create a much more co coherent sensitivity map. And then a third uh, visualization technique they used was multiplying the gradients uh, with the uh, input image. So what they would do is they would take the actual pixel values. For example, if we were to take the actual pixel values of this shark image, and then they would multiply it times the gradient base values of the gradient map. And this often uh, produced a final map that was much simpler and sharper. Uh, and they did this uh, because uh, they wanted to um, weight the gradient base values with the actual pixel values. So they use the actual pixel values as a weight uh, to get the overall, uh, to see its, uh, its contribution to the overall map. And just like absolute value multiplication can impact the output representation. And so the choice of doing this um, visualization technique is very much image dependent. Uh, there, uh, in the smooth grad technique, there are two parameters. Um, the first parameter is sigma or the sig um, standard deviation that controlled the noise level of the perturbations. And then the second hyperparameter is n, which controls the number of samples to average over. So in fine tuning, uh, these parameters, the uh, researchers found that a noise level of about 10 to 20 percent balances the sharpness and the structure of the image. And about a sample size of 50 provided the smoothest gradient. So to be able to fine tune these parameters, um, uh, I'll give you an example. So if we take a look at this image of a just gazelle here on the left, to be able to fine tune the sample size, they would keep, uh, they would hold steady uh, the noise level about 10%. And then they would change the sample size and see how the sample size affected the uh, sensitivity map. So when they first started with a sample size of two, uh, they, their sensitivity map produced a very cloudy, very noisy image. And increasing the sample size to five, Reduce or reduce the noise and increase the sharpness of the image. Uh, increasing the sample size to 20, you can start to make out the antlers and the, the body and the legs. And by the time uh, they reach a sample size of 50, uh, they get a shape and uh, in a, in a sensitivity map that closely resembles the gazelle in the input image. But if they continue to increase the sample size, to say to 100, they don't get that much improvement. In fact, they actually get a degradation. So uh, they found that uh, when fine tuning the sample size, a sample size of 50 uh, produces the, uh, the smoothest gradient for ImageNet. So when fine tuning the noise level, um, what they did was they kept, um, the number, they kept the uh, sample size constant at 50, and then they varied the noise level. And, to, and then they looked at the sensitivity maps. To, and if we, for example, take these uh, three images of a gazelle here on the left, when they apply a noise level of 0%, which is equivalent to uh, vanilla gradient, they get a very cloudy, very uh, noisy image. But when they increase the noise, that started to make the images a little bit more sharper. Further increasing the noise started to make the objects much more def defined and clear. And likewise, for 20%, if we look at the top image, the, uh, the gazelle, you can see a little bit clearer the head and also the antlers. But in some cases, for example, the gazelle at the bottom, uh, increasing the uh, noise level from 10% to 20% actually caused the, the image to become more cloudy. 
and about 30%, all the images started to degrade. And then and at 50%, uh, the, all the images started to get uh, much more cloudy and you start to lose some of the structure. So uh, approximately about 10 to 20% was the uh, best noise level the researchers found when they fine tuned the noise level for, MNIST, for the MNIST data set. They also uh, fine tuned the noise level for the MNIST data set uh, using the same uh, similar strategy. Uh, they kept the noise, um, the sample size constant at 100 images, and then they started to vary the noise. And so at 0%, which is vanilla gradient, you could see a much more cloudy, much more noisy image. But as they started to increase the noise level, the images started to get much more clear. And about 25% uh, was where the point where they re many of the images became the most clear. You can make out the one, the seven, the two and four, and, uh, and somewhat the zero. Uh, but if we increase the noise level to 50%, for example, if you look at the image one, if you look at uh, the number one in the middle, you can see that the noise level starts to increase. And about 75%, the noise level increases further. So for the MNIST data set, a noise level about 25% uh, was best for uh, when they conducted their experiments. All right. Uh, so um, one issue the authors faced was that they couldn't uh, quantitatively evaluate their method. So what they did was they qualitatively compared it to work from other people. So they compared it to the vanilla maps, which are the normal gradients, they're noisy, as long with the integrated and the guided bat propagation methods that I mentioned earlier. And what they found was that their method had more impact uh, when an image had an object surrounded by a uniform background. And they also found it to be more coherent than the integrated vanilla sensitivity maps with the exception of guided bat propagation, which I'll mention uh, in a bit. So these images here are examples of 200 samples uh, of images they chose from ImageNet. Um, and these images are images where SmoothGrad had a high impact. So all these images here, the drilling platform, the shark, and the snake, they all have uniform backgrounds. So as you see here, uh, for the uniform backgrounds, uh, Smooth Grab actually has a better result uh, for the image coherency than integrated and vanilla. And also another uh, issue is that guided back propagation actually does not work at all with uh, uniform backgrounds. You can actually slightly see some features like the edge outlines of the shark and then uh, the drilling platform, but it's not good compared to any of the other methods. Uh, and then also they show their gradient being multiplied by the image and actually shows that their uh, method for uniform backgrounds is much smoother than the other method. So these images are where SmoothGrad has like a lower impact. So they don't have uniform backgrounds uh, such as this lorikeet, the snake, and this coyote. Um, they all have backgrounds where textures vary so you would see here, uh, the reason they only mention it's better than integrated and vanilla explicitly is because in this case, guided bat propagation actually performs the best uh, when an object is surrounded by an, a non-uniform background. Uh, Smooth rad actually still performs better than vanilla and integrated as it actually has a mo more coherent uh, sensitivity map than the other two. And as you see here, when you actually multiply grain by image, you can clearly see how more sharp the guided back propagation is uh, for the uh, non-uniform background flat. All right, so um, they also did another uh, qualitative evalu evaluation for discriminativity compared to the other methods. So in order to do this, uh, they had an image where there's two objects uh, with different classes. So they would compute uh, a gradient a sensitivity map for each class. So the, they then uh, take the difference between these two uh, gradients and use them to create a diverging color map. So these two images uh, both have a cat and dog in them. And as you see here for the vanilla one, that you can't really, uh, it sort of separates the cat and dog well enough. But for the second image, you, it's really hard to tell like where the cat is. 
Uh, integrated performs better a bit than vanilla. Um, guided bat propagation actually uh, doesn't perform very well at all uh, when it comes to discrimination, but it also could potentially be due to removing those negative uh, gradients from the modified bat propagation process. So there are probably fewer uh, units being activated in these maps. So you can sort of see the face of the dog and the cat, uh, but not as clear as the other ones. And then with Smooth Ride, you can actually clearly see uh, features of the dog, such as its ears now and the face of the cat. And then also the head of the bulldog as long as uh, where the cat is. So, so another uh, thing they propose is also like combining their method with the other method. So they're doing a type of augmentation. Uh, so they took these images here as an example where you have a desktop, knee pads, soap dispenser, and a lighter. Uh, where the first two uh, here have uniform backgrounds. So you see uh, with integrated, it's rather noisy. But when they uh, combine the integrated method with their smooth grad method, uh, it actually um, removes the noise around the uniform background. And you can clearly see the desktop computer now, along with the knee pad, soap dispenser, and lighter. <clears throat> for guided back propagation, however, uh, for the first two images, uh, these are both uniform. So of course, they're not barely seen. So when guided bat propagation is uh, combined with smooth rod, uh, it sort of turns them into like edge maps uh, for guided bat propagation. And it also uh, enhances the non-uniform images such as a soap dispenser and lighter. Uh, another method they did was also to combine their, uh, met their smooth rod method during training the model instead. So they applied it to samples during training and also like about evaluation. And they actually found it improves the uh, sensitivity map further, which is shown in these uh, two images here. So with the MNIST uh, data set, they have like a confusion matrix where they show the cases uh, where they have no noise, uh, noise just for training and noise just for evaluation and then both. So by adding noise for both training and evaluation, for the samples, uh, it further improves the output of the uh, sensitivity map for the new pre-trained model. And it also implies the same for uh, ImageNet as well, where you can clearly see the Giselle uh, from this image more coherently. So to conclude, um, um, these sensitivity maps are very good for visualizing pixels that are important for, uh, for the model to be able to predict and um, uh, do performance decision making, but the issue with uh, uh, these visual uh, uh, sensitivity maps is they tend to be noisy, and so they tend to be noisy, and they're noisy because of varying local gradients. Um, so, because of these uh, noisy maps, that motivated the researchers to. Uh, uh, introduced a technique called smooth grad, and they were able to show that smooth grad uh, visually sharpened uh, sensitivity maps better than previous techniques at, at the time that this paper was written. And smooth grad works by applying small perturbations to the input image and then uh, averaging all the maps together. And you can also perform smooth grad by training on data that's been perturbed, that's been perturbed with random noise. Uh, the paper had some strengths and weaknesses. Uh, among the strengths is that um, uh, the smooth grad was, uh, compared to previous techniques at the time it was published, it, was a, it did do a better job at uh, producing much more clear, much more coherent, less noisy maps compared to previous techniques. Another advantage uh, to the paper is that smooth grad as a, as a concept was very simple and it was relatively easy to implement. And then uh, another strength of the paper was that the Reachers was the first to propose an explanation for the noise that uh, was seen in the sensitivity maps. Prior to this paper, this was never addressed. But the paper also had some weaknesses. Among the weaknesses are that many of the ideas are not novel. For example, previous researchers have previous researchers have used uh, raw gradients to create sensitive, sensitivity maps, and adding noise to training is a common regularization technique. And stochastic pro approximation has been used in other domains, uh, including machine learning. 
Uh, an example in machine learning is stochastic gradient descent. So in, in stochastic gradient descent, instead of doing a full uh, gradient descent optimization on the entire data set, they, they do an estimate of the gradient descent on uh, subsamples of the data set. And this was able to enable uh, stochastic, stochastic gradient descent to perform gradient descent uh, for large data sets. So stochastic gradient, uh, so stochastic approximations are not new. Another weakness to the paper was the authors had hypothesized that the sensitivity maps were truthful depictions of what the network is doing. But later papers uh, have disputed this idea. For example, Ken Sayo and their colleagues in 2019 conducted an experiment where they took images from the CIFAR-10 data set. For example, this image of a frog, a horse, and a ship. And uh, what they would do is, uh, to these images, they would replace on the upper left corner of every image, they would replace it, uh, the image with a 10 by 10 patch of uniform noise. And then they would train the neural network on these occluded images, uh, run the uh, classification, and then take a look at the sensitivity maps. And if you look at the sensitivity maps, there are pixels being highlighted. And if you go with the, what the researchers say in SmoothGrad, these, are, pick, these pixels are relevant for being able to uh, predicting the object. But as you can see, um, these, uh, these uh, patches um, have nothing to do or are completely irrelevant to the object. And a final, and a final weakness to the paper is even though SmoothGrad uh, was an improvement over previous techniques. Uh, it still produced images that had noisy boundaries. Uh, there were other techniques that came out after this paper um, that was able to produce uh, better sensitivity maps. For example, uh, Serenivis and their, his colleagues in 2019 proposed full grad. So uh, this is an improvement over smooth grad. For example, we take a look at this image of a uh, a spider on this branch. If you look at smooth grad, uh, the pixels tend to be noisy. And not only that, um, it tends to highlight pixels on the spider and also the branch uh, rather than just the spider itself. But in smooth grad, uh, the only, only the images that are highlighted are those uh, relate, um, that has to do with the spider only. And you don't see any pixels or any uh, highlighted pixels in the branch. And smooth grad works uh, and they were able to achieve this by, instead of taking the uh, final gradients at the end of the neural, neural network, they took gradients at each layer of the neural network uh, and then uh, created a sensitivity map. Here in this picture, you only sampled a few of the um, sensitivity maps from some of the layers, not all of them, but they would, in, a, in full grad, they sum all these, they take the, um, sensitivity maps from all of the layers, and then they would sum them up to create the final full ground image. So this concludes our presentation. Thank